Today, I want to tell you a bit about an exciting future that isn't getting the attention it deserves. It's about the future of space and its economic potential. Already, the return of investment from space is about $400 billion. By 2030, it is estimated that it will be about $1.4 trillion. And that is just limited to satellite-based support system. If we include space-based resources like lunar resources and asteroid mining, it is estimated to be in the trillions of dollars. My work is at the nexus of international relations, grand strategy, and space policy. How I picked this particular academic discipline can be traced back to my upbringing in a very small rural mountain town in northeast India. Growing up, I had access to my father's library, which consisted of exciting and very deeply philosophical books on world politics, international relations, the scramble for Africa, colonialism and its impact on society. And I was deeply inspired to follow and continue with that kind of study. Now, growing up in Northeast India had another very distinctive advantage. During the monsoons, we would lose power sometimes to the tune of a month because your poles broke because of landslides. But that had the advantage for a child because I got access to the night sky without the distraction of artificial lights, including moonlight and starlight. And I was deeply inspired and in awe. Today, when I navigate the world of international relations, space governance, space policy, including testifying at the U.S. Congress, I am reminded of those nights often. Since 1999, when I started my PhD in international organization from Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, to becoming a research fellow at India's premier think tank, the Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis, to today when I've started my own consultancy, my academic philosophy is based on an inclusive methodology, which is, means it's interdisciplinary. So I study international relations, but I also study study ethnic conflicts, conflict resolution, and conflict transformation. The theme of this event is fearless. I want to tell you all a story from my own life in which I needed to be fearless. During fieldwork and collection of data in one of the most remotest areas in the India-Burma border, my vehicle in which I was traveling was taken into custody without my consent by an Indian armed secessionist group who questioned me for four hours about my work and why I was there. At that time, I knew I was at great risk, but something within me told me that I have to be fearless, I have to remain calm and answer their questions. In the end, they let me go. In fact, they apologized for taking me into custody without consent, and they said I am their sister. And so that kind of life and that kind of work is so important to understand as we shift into space as well. When I shifted to the United States, I was encouraged to basically look at space and space policy by a colleague of mine who told me that my expertise in international relations will help me understand what countries like China, India, and US were doing in terms of space policy and space governance. Now, coming back a bit again to the concept of fearlessness, based on which I had to take up a very new field, I learned about fearlessness from my father, a man who was orphaned at a very young age, and yet with his dedication and his passion, he was able to make something of his life and give us a good life. That kind of motivation and that kind of concept is so important for all of us. In that same vein of inspiration, I want to tell you a story again from my own life. One day, I got a call from a very young student, a female student, who told me that she would like to come and see me in my office. So when I met her, she revealed that she actually wanted to give up her life and her career in terms of looking at international relations and academics because of the fact that she faced prejudices in terms of her sex. However, 
at her lowest ebb and her lowest point. She saw me on a panel talking about the kind of work she's interested in and being able to defend positions that she thought was valuable to her. And she said that that inspired her. The fact that another woman would see me with inspiration deeply humbled me and deeply affected me. You could also be a part of such a story. You could also use your life as an inspiration for someone else who is at their lowest ebb, helping them to rise like a phoenix. In fact, when I think of space policy and space study, don't you think a rocket is also like a phoenix that rises up against the gravity pull of Earth which does not want to let it go and yet it needs that kind of inspiration and force to get into the night sky? Space is pretty inspirational and pretty exciting. In fact, during the Cold War, we all know from our history is that space was all about competition and great power rivalry. In fact, th at that time, if you remember, it was that particular beautiful night in October 1957 that humanity's destiny and understanding of themselves changed forever with the blip blip of Sputnik in 1957. To the landing of humans, on the, far, on, the, on the lunar surface for the first time in 1969. However, today, the discourse on space has changed. It's not just about rivalry and competition. Space today is seen as something that is going to offer access to humanity to the resources that are there in the inner solar system. Understanding the limits of our world, being humble about it, opening access to space for those billions who want to go there is the discourse that affects societies and states today. Professor Wang Shiji, the founder of China's orbital rocket, tells it best. He says that humanity will one day panic when we run out of fossil fuel, and that is why humanity and states need to collectively invest in renewable energies like space-based solar power, as well as the energies that are available in the solar system. Now, space-based solar power is a technology that envisions and aspires to collect sunlight in space because it's 24 hours and does not suffer from the problems of weather. Space has already changed the lives of people around us. And you can see that, in fact, when you use your GPS to go from one point to the other, you're helping in reducing global emissions. Space helps you monitor your climate. Space helps you monitor weather, e-education, e-commerce, you can name it. It actually helps societies who do not have access to the kind of internet and privileges we have, especially in the developed world. Now, it is in that vein I would like to tell you a bit about what countries are doing in space. So, for example, I'll tell you a bit about what China is doing in space, including asteroid mining. Now, Professor John Lewis, the author of Mining the Sky, tells you that there are resources out there that humanity needs to access and learn to extract. For example, he tells you about a very small asteroid 3554 Amum, which is a, actually just a mile in length, but has resources to the tune of $20 trillion, including platinum, cobalt, and iron ore. So in that context, China is actually hoping to develop their own asteroid mining capability. Last week, China sent up a lunar mission to bring back lunar samples about 51 years after the Apollo landings gave, our, gave us our first lunar rocks. India is also investing in a space capacity, especially India's lunar mission in 2008, actually told humanity that there could be water ice on the lunar surface, so critical for human sustainability if you want to become a spacefaring civilization. India and Japan are collaborating to go to the lunar uh, South Pole by 2025 to prospect for resources. The United States also has a very fascinating space program today. In fact, the Artemis moon mission is hoping to land humanity's first woman on the lunar south pole and the next man. The Air Force Research Laboratory is investing in the concept called space-based solar power as well as the U.S. Naval Laboratory. Now, it's not just great powers like China, India, or the U.S. that are investing in space. Smaller countries like UAE and Luxembourg are hoping to construct and develop space governance regimes that are inclusive and diverse. In fact, African countries have started their first African space 
Mission and African Space Agency last year, supported and mandated by the African Union. I feel deeply humbled and fortunate to be able to share my research across the world to students, global communities that are interested in an inspirational future, including the Young Space Generation Advisory Council, that are young people wanting to go to space, to include diplomats and students from Africa, Asia, Latin America, Australia. And so, and, and finally, I would say in that particular context that I also am so fortunate to be able to talk to the young lieutenants of the United States Space Force and Air Force who wants to actually secure space for humanity. My work is to craft the most inclusive vision for humanity in space. However, given my expertise in international relations, I would be remiss if I did not tell you the possibility of differences. Take, for example, the Lunar South Pole. You can have country A that lands there and establishes a zone of non-interference and a mining facility. Now think of if a country B wants to land there as well, and country A refuses to give permission. That could lead to differences. And that kind of space governance regimes based on legality is missing today in the academic discourse. And that is why my work is basically motivated to fill in that particular gap. The Outer Space Treaty, signed in 1967 between the US, the USSR, and the United Kingdom, and has been ratified by 110 countries today, talks about prohibiting the weapons of mass destruction in space, but does not tell us how to share resources. For example, if you go up and own property, how are you going to share it with others, given the fact that the Outer Space Treaty tells us in Article 1 that space is the province of mankind. The word mankind kind is legally used in the Outer Space Treaty. To conclude, I would say that it is in the critical juncture of our lives today that space has become so critical for everything we do today, including at the time of COVID-19. We do not want a repeat of the age of imperialism and colonization that negatively affected societies. But we also do not want to limit future generations and billions of people around the world who are inspired by space and want to have access to it. So my work is about building inclusive futures. I think you can do it too. You can build futures that talk about inclusivity, diversity, not just ethnic diversity, but also knowledge diversity, which is so important the way we go forward. No matter what obstacles come my, come my way, I'm going to continue my work in this particular field, especially to represent the voices in technology and space that are not heard. Let us democratize space. Thank you.